Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now the snake was the most cutting of all the wild animals that God, that the Lord God had made. He asked the woman, Did God really say you shall not eat of any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the snake, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it, or else you will die. But the snake said to the woman, You certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods who know good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, and the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, this is full of lots of interesting things. The first thing I'd like to point out is that Satan is um, clearly lying to the woman. God knows well that your eyes will be opened. And he's suggesting that, he says, you will be like gods. So this original temptation then for Eve was that she could become divine. She could reach this higher place on the scale of creation. We already know that Adam and Eve are above all the animals. We just discussed that. What she wants to do now is to become even like God, but without God's help. All you have to do is just eat the tree. Isn't this a common temptation that we have nowadays? You know, to think, well, you know, I can just by my technology or you know this sort of advanced, advanced technology, then I can almost become divine. Isn't it funny how if I put one little blog post, it goes all over the world? I mean, that's that's like an increase of knowledge. And then when people look at me, you know, and they take your photo, you know, one of these celebrities, the celebrity does something like, oh, look, he's cut, you know, look, he he um, he wore spandex, you know, yellow spandex. Everybody, oh, shocking. And um, and now it's you know it's all over it's all over the world. And so in a certain way, he's almost extending his existence by means of these photos, by means of his little tweet. Yeah, wore the yellow pants, like him. And, um, and people are like, oh, shocking, I can't believe he's saying And so this is something that starts to extend your existence, and you start to think, well, maybe, maybe I can almost become like God. God is everywhere. God has all power. All people want to love God. So Eve's, Eve's temptation, then, was to become like God, but without God's help. This is something that she then brought to Adam. Now, the thing about Adam is... What's going on with Adam while Eve's being tempted? It says that Adam was with her. Isn't that interesting? Why wasn't Adam defending her from the snake? Why wasn't he saying something like, Hey, you're a talking snake. <laughs> what are you doing here? Adam wasn't protecting her. You see, Adam was maybe witnessing this dialogue between Eve and the snake, or maybe Adam was nearby. If he was off in a distance, he wasn't even there for her. And then he wanders along, but Adam wasn't there for her, whether he was physically present or not. He wasn't there for her. And so we can say that Adam, uh, Adam was in a certain way of a disposing cause to Eve's sin. Isn't that interesting? Everybody, oh, it, it was Eve's fault. But part of the question is, well, why wasn't Adam uh, with her and discussing these issues and trying to um, keep her from that temptation. <clears throat> of course, it's not as if, well, oh, you have to have the man or else a woman's going to sin. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just suggesting that when there are two people together that are made for each other, that know each other and love each other, it's a life-giving relationship. And now what happens is that they're separated and then trouble comes in. So Eve then, she disobeys God. She desires divinity on her own, and now Adam does too. And so then now they both know what it's like to sin. They know what it's like to try to achieve this new level of consciousness or divinity without God. And it just leads to unhappiness. Now, of course, when we look at, the, at this um, story in Genesis, it's, it's of course using some figurative language, and some people call it mythology. We wouldn't suggest that, but we would say that it's telling us something true. A real event about real people. Do you know that they've actually done genetic studies? And so, you know, for, for men, um, you know, men have an XY chromosome when you look at their genes, right? And women, they have XX, okay? 
Because of this, all men inherit something from their father. Their part of the Y chromosome can be traced to their father. So there's part of my genes that I got from my dad. And then he got it from his dad and so on. You know, we did genealogical studies, my family, we did a little bit, the Sullivans. And um, we can trace all of our family back to Ireland. But that was 16 generations ago. <laughs> We've been in the US for a long time. But you know what? They can actually trace now every single living man back to one man. This is, this is a scientific fact. I saw this on Science Online just very recently. They can trace all living women back to one woman in Africa. And she lived all, you know, generally around the same time and the same place as this other one man. Now, if you look in the science article, you know, of course, it says something like, well, we don't know if they actually ever met. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, it's not like, um, but maybe they did meet. And maybe it's actually corroborating something that we know by God's revelation. So this is something that's very interesting. And when we start to talk about the original couple, it also tells us something about ourselves. So what are the consequences of um, can we shut that door? Do you think that'd be possible? There we go. Thank you. Okay, so so the um, so what's going to happen with this uh, original sin of Adam and Eve? It's going to have consequences for everything. And um, the image I'm going to give is um, okay. Red. Red is going to represent um, love. You know, violet and roses are red. Okay, good. So, um, so this represents this represents love. And when God created all things in the beginning, as I said, they were all all harmonious because God is singing this song, right? So everything that exists within the song exists in a special harmony. They don't contradict each other. It's a variety in a unity. It's sort of like a symphony. If you bring in the um, you know first you start with the oboe, and then you have the flute, and then you have the strings and you even have the timpani, all this can work within a harmonious whole, right? So similarly, in God's original creation, all things existed in a harmony. And so, Adam, as I said, he was green, he got along with the tree very well, and he could pet the animal, and, and he could name it, and they, and they knew each other. And so we can say that they were, they were all linked together, Okay, and this is linked, and even the animal is linked to the tree, it's beautiful. You see, you see this little circle of love? Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Okay, so, um, so this, is, this is how God meant all things to be. And what happens with the sin is that first notice that Adam is now eating the tree, and so he's eating of the tree that God told him not to, and so this actually means that Adam is using creation in a way that God didn't intend. So he's actually using it in a way that is unharmonious. There's a disharmony between Adam and creation. Okay? And so we might say that this is one reason why the animals and the trees, why they work more harmoniously than we do, because they don't sin. Whereas it's always our tendency to exploit other people, Eve exploiting Adam, perhaps, or the other way around. And so is our tendency to try to exploit creation for our own good, not considering the good of the whole. So there's, of course, a separation not only on this created level, there's also a, um, a separation where, you know, God, there's a separation between man and God as well. Once we were bound by all these chains of love, and now it's, oh, it doesn't quite reach. You know, and if God's love, if it contains all things, but man isn't reaching up with there, there's a contradiction between man's love and God's plan for that love. There's a separation not only between man and creation, there's a separation between man and himself within our own hearts. St. Paul describes this very well. He says, I do not understand my own actions. The things that I do not want to do, I do. I do the very thing that I hate. The good that I want to do, I do not do. It's the evil I don't want to do. Don't we all experience that? You know, there's something where I can't even, I don't even have the self-control that I would like. 
I might have self-control in one particular area in my life. I'm really strong, you know, I'm, I exercise regularly and I'm you know, very disciplined about that. But then when it comes to something else, I can hardly say no. <laughs> so there's also this contradiction in ourselves. My, my soul as it were wars against itself. And of course there's separation from the human family. God described these separations as part of his curses. He said that the man is, because of sin, dominating the woman. And the woman desires after the man. And so now they exist in this fallen state. The, um, the result of this is that now we're in a disordered situation. Creation doesn't exist in the order it was meant to have. We don't have the relationships that we were meant to have. And there's not this vertical relationship either. Everything is now off kilter. Now, we, sometimes people ask, okay, well, Adam and Eve have this disorder. Okay, we understand that. And they, you know, they were disconnected from God. But how does that affect me? How does that you know, come down to us all these ages later? Well, the answer to this is, um, I don't think you can see it very well, but on my finger, my poor finger, this is demonstration number one, um, there is, it's, um, you want me to draw my finger for you? <laughs> It'll be outside of creation for a second. Okay. So, um, okay, there's the digit. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to draw the nail. Okay. Ooh. Oh, sharp nail. Okay, anyway. Okay. I have this little thing on my finger that, like that. And um, for the longest time, it's like right here, right there. For the longest time, I thought that I had cut myself, you know, by um, slicing tomatoes or something like that. You know, sometimes you do this, and you're kind of like, whoops, oh no. And so I thought that, and I'm like, oh, I have a little scar on my forefinger. Huh. But then one day, I was looking at my dad, and I was like, hey, dad, did you cut your finger too? <laughs> and he says, no. And we look at it, it's the same finger, the same exact thing, and I realized, this is a genetic defect I inherited from my dad. Just this little thing. And so then we call my grandpa up, and we're like, grandpa, <laughs> look at your left forefinger. <laughs> what? Just look at it. And he says, okay, like, do, you, do you see a little scar right there? He says, yeah. Well, where'd you get that from? He says, I don't know. I just figured I cut myself. We're like, actually, no. It's part of the Sullivan gene. <laughs> now, we don't have my great-grandfather. He's not alive, so we can't check. And um, if we were to dig him up, we wouldn't find anything. But I'm going to suspect that this is something, you know, over time, this is just one of those things that you get. This is a little bit like original sin. Uh, it's something that we inherit from our original parents. It's the condition into which we were born in the world. And it's actually passed on through generation. You know how um, sometimes a child whose mother was addicted to drugs, you know, the child can, can be born addicted to drugs? Or a better example would be um, a child whose mother had HIV born with HIV, right? This is, this is basically what original sin is for us, is we are born into this condition, this condition in which we're separated from you know, the animals, we're separated from God, we're separated from all of creation, and we're even separated from ourselves. This helps to explain um, why we have war, why we have disease, why we have sadness, there's something missing in this world. Something's not quite right. Some way people try to describe the sort of situation in which we find ourselves in this world is by um, describing that it's almost as if you know we were on one of these deserted islands and we wake up, you know, and you're like, I don't quite feel at home. It, it, it's familiar, but not quite home for me. This is why these, these sorts of movies are always very popular with us. People getting lost, and they're trying to find their way home. There's, there's something about that that you know, sort of strikes the chord. We also like the stories of you know, people escaping, you know, going on these great journeys. Um, there's, there's a true story about these men who are in a communist gulag, and they literally cross Tibet. <laughs> they go over the, you know, these mountains in order to get to freedom. Um, you know, these sorts of stories to us are amazing, and there's something that kind of echoes in our souls. It's because we're not quite home in this world. On account of this original sin, we find ourselves, as it were, lost. 
and we want to get back to that place where we will feel like all things are put right again. So this, this situation then tells us a little bit about evil. Evil isn't simply a thing that exists in itself. We don't believe in the yin and the yang. It's not as if the whole world is divided into light or dark, and I'm trying to get you to, you know, okay, join the, join the light side. Um, you know, if you think about Star Wars, like what makes the good side of the Force more powerful than the dark side? I mean, according to this, you know, sort of, you know, a vague notion, well, the dark side could rise again, and they could have, you know, lots of people that they, you know, subjugate under their will, and they can, you know, once again overcome, and then George Lucas is going to have to come out with a sequel. Oh, there is a sequel coming up. Maybe we'll see what happens. Okay, now, now, what this shows us is that intrinsically, if you have this sort of dualistic notion that, well, some people are good, and they happen to be good, some people are bad, and they happen to be bad, that doesn't tell us per se that these aren't just like two equal but opposite sides just kind of battling it out. But according to the Catholic notion, the Christian notion, is that there's only good in the beginning, and out of that goodness God sings, the bad angels have a discordant note, and then the people who fall also are now within this discordant nature. What, is, what God is calling us to do then is to join again that song, sung with him and the angels and the saints that have gone before us. And so if we have, as it were, been born into this discordant <coughs> music, this you know, rage, God is telling us that there's actually, if we listen quietly enough, we can actually hear him speak. We hear him speak by looking at the order of creation. This is all within God's love. And then there's revelation where God speaks to us himself. So how do we deal with original sin? Well, if we go back to chapter 3. And... Um, Go down to uh, verse 7. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They know they, they have to hide themselves from each other. And so they sew fig leaves together and make loincloths for themselves. I don't want you to know me. I want to be known, but I kind of don't. When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden at the breezy time of the day, the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, we want to be known, but we also want to hide. We want to hide ourselves even from God, who knows everything. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? This is a question God asks all of us. Where are you in your life? Where are you with respect to eternity? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I did. You see, Adam now, before he wasn't afraid of God. Isn't that interesting? Before he sinned, before he disobeyed God, he had complete trust and love. And now, after this, he has a fear of God that's no longer natural. And so then finally what happens is the Lord, he wants to get to the bottom of this. And so the man blames the woman. The woman whom you put here with me, she did it. And then God asks the woman, well, what did, well, why did you do this? And she says, the snake tricked me. And the cheese stands alone. So <coughs> God begins by cursing the snake. And um, verse 15 is the key point that I'd like to point out here. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. They will strike at your heel, your head, while you strike at their heel. So this is um, this is something then, it's, it's actually a promise. And it's a promise of hope, because what, what God is saying is that between God and the woman, or all the children of Eve, now we're going to be in this perpetual battle. And the devil, sin, is going to try to attack us. And we're going to have to defend ourselves from it. And so this is actually also a prophecy. And we're going to end with where this prophecy is tending. So now I'm going to ask you to look at the very end of the Bible. We're going to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. This is uh, page 1413. 
1413. So the very beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of the world, we have the woman and the snake. And now here in chapter 12, we have another woman. A great sign appeared in the sky. So it's page 1413, chapter 12, verse 1. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. She was with child, and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. And then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns. Now who's this woman, and who's this dragon? Let's keep going. The dragon swept away a third of the stars of the sky, and hurled them down to the earth. Does this sound familiar? When the devil fell, a third of the angels fell with him. The dragon stood before the woman about to give birth to devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male child, destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God in his throne. This is actually Mary giving birth to Jesus. Jesus was caught up to God at his ascension. The woman, Mary, flees into the desert where she had a place prepared for her by God. And then, if you want to hear the story again in a different way, it starts again in verse 7. A war bracket broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and its angels fought it back. They did not prevail. And then um, there's no longer any place for them in heaven. Verse 9, the huge dragon, the ancient serpent, it's the same one we saw in Genesis, who's called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world and was thrown down to the earth, and its angels were thrown down with it. Isn't that so interesting? And then a loud voice comes from heaven, now salvation and power have come. It's, it's the song of Christ overcoming. So all of this, it's, it's figurative language once again, but basically it's telling us that Genesis and the woman and the man who fell it's telling us about the end of time when there's another woman and another man. And this woman is Mary. She gives birth to Jesus. And it says that the serpent is fighting against them too. But in this case, against Mary and Jesus, the devil does not overcome. And instead, she flees to the desert. This is Mary going out into the world. The church now being saved from the devil. And eventually... Christ wins his victory. So, if we have original sin, and we do, and it comes from our original parents, well, the, the sin that, that they committed and that we, we inherit this disordered situation is now undone by the work of Christ through his mother, Mary. Isn't that beautiful? So the first Adam and the first Eve, now we might say the second Adam and the second Eve are here for us. And so that's that's a presentation for this evening. Now, are there any questions? Yeah. I didn't understand your last statement. The are there any questions part? <laughs> <laughs> the statement before that. About Mary and No, Adam and Eve and then Adam and Eve. Ah, okay, right. So um, okay, okay, so I'll 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 describe that in a little more detail. So um, Adam was underneath the tree. And um, Mary was underneath the tree, and then Mary took the fruit that she shouldn't, or, I'm sorry, I'm getting all the names mixed up. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were underneath the tree, right? Yeah. And then Eve takes the fruit that she shouldn't eat, the forbidden fruit, she eats it, she gives it to Adam. Well, we have Jesus, he's on a tree, the cross. And then we have Mary, the woman, who she accepts the fruit of the cross, namely Jesus' death and then his resurrection. And so, so Mary is the opposite of Eve, okay. and Jesus is the opposite of Adam. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Any, any more questions? Yeah. I'm uh, just coming from uh, more of a fundamentalist background, uh, where there was a liberal interpretation of the creation story. Where does the Catholic doctrine play ball as far as mentioning it? It's a real event, but just how really do you interpret the first three or four chapters of Genesis, and uh, or is there some freedom just to interpret it however you want to go? Okay, good question. So, um, 
you know, uh, first there are different ways of taking something literally, and, and the first thing we have to say is, what Genesis tells us is true? And the question is, okay, well, what is it telling us? But just as a matter of principle, the Bible contains the truth that God speaks to us, and God speaks to us in different ways. So I would say that it's completely reasonable not to take it as literal. For instance, some people will say, well, you know, these days of creation, the first day and the second day, um, but the way we calculate time is by the movement of the sun, or you know, the movement of the, of the earth around the sun. And, well, um, God didn't create the sun until the third day. So, when we're talking about the days of creation, we can't mean literal 24-hour days because there's no way to mark the time <laughs> um, if there's no sun. So that, to me, seems pretty obvious. Um, but then the next question is, all right, well, then God after the sun was created, and then we have you know, six 24-hour <laughs> days? No, probably not. Um, so, so what it's telling us is what I was mentioning before about the hierarchy of creation. That's, that's one of the truths that it contains. Um, sometimes people want to know what does the Catholic Church say about evolution. What we would say is that if evolution happened, it's something that has to exist within the creation of God. It's, it's something that is part of God's plan and creation. So um, God could have created everything that sprang up out of nothing, or God cre could have created a mechanism in creation such that he gives it um, in, in, you know, a push, and then the things start to develop on their own, and then God can tweak them here and there, and he can create man out of that. So, so we would say that, no, a, a strict 24-hour literal reading doesn't make any sense. But then beyond that, we have to use our reason and our theology and try to bring those together to harmonize with science as much as possible. You know, what about the garden? Is there a little garden? Is there a little, a little apple? Um, well, Genesis doesn't say apple. It actually says fruit. Um, so the uh, so it's giving us a little more, maybe just an orange, you know, or <laughs> the banana. Um, I don't know. The, um, so so what, what, what we're saying is that there really was and Adam, there really was an Eve. There are two real people from whom we are all descended, and they really did sin. And if Adam and Eve lived, they had to live in a place. Probably the place was paradise. But beyond that, it's hard to sometimes distinguish between figurative language and um, literal language. But something can be true even though it's figurative, right? If I say that the sun is kissing the branches as it descends into the horizon, well, you know what I mean, but it's not literal, right? So it has a truth there, but it's a poetic truth. So, so we need to think a little more broadly in those terms. When Jesus says, um, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. I don't know many Christians who are going around, you know, <laughs> you get two chances. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> So, so we have to, you know, we have to be a little, little prudent about the way we uh, interpret these things. Any other uh, questions before we go? No. Yeah. The final um, passage. Um, what exactly? When does that happen? You said it's a prophecy. So it's a prophecy of when Jesus is born. So it's a prophecy about what had already happened. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So. How can it be a prophecy about the past? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. This prophecy is about, supposed to be about the future. The, um, basically, the book of Revelation contains a lot of things about the future, but also contains things about things, um, sometimes it's about the past, and sometimes it's about what's happening in the present. So the book of Revelation is uh, quite difficult. In this case, we would say, well, it's contained in a book of prophecy. Most of Revelation is about the future, but this particular instance, one thing is about things that are timeless, angels fighting with each other, that happens outside of time. And then it's talking about something that happens in time. Mary giving birth to Jesus. But then it's also pointing to the future, about the final uh, victory of the woman and all of her offspring, us, overcoming Satan. So it's, it's kind of all three. It's about the past, the present, and the future. Yeah. All right, well, well um, I think uh, that's, that's it for now. And so when we come back,